Welcome everyone, the Montreal Dev episode 29. Every time I, I check this theme song, I'm always pumped up. So here I have three amazing speakers. Today we will talk about the state of the Node.js core and we have super experts today. So sound check and then we will start right over. So are you all there? How are you? I'm here. I'm here. Perfect. Oh, I'm still Perfect. here. Hello. Perfect. Perfect. Hello. Yeah, we'll explain why this. There is a reason why you're saying this. Yeah, it's really yes. Here. Okay. So today everything seems to work. This will probably change soon. I also been to the dentist. You can see white teeth. So perfect. We can we can start. So before we start, just a kind of reminder that this is a free event offered for you by you to from the LeadDev. The LeadDev is an incredible tool to stay up to date as a developer. Not just that, we are moving to the community part. There is something called squads. So we are moving very fast. This makes my job as a developer advocate super hard because I have to keep pace with all the features that has been released. So that's it. Uh, I also forget forgot to say that everything is free. So you can just go to daily.dev and you can check it out. Super easy, very focused on developers, of course. Nice, nice. So I see many people here. Nimrod also, the CEO is here, front end maker, hi everyone. So let's go in order. We have Colin, Matteo, and Michael. So uh, I, I have to kick Matteo and Michael. So see you later. The whole event will last one hour and a half. So 25 minutes for all the speakers. You can drop your questions while the speaker is talking, and then we'll have five minutes of Q&A sessions. Perfect. So, hi, bye, Matteo, bye, Michael. Let's remove them, one yes, and two. Perfect. Colin, welcome in this uh, Demo 3 Dev episode 29. I've been doing this uh, since October 2022 as a, as a host, November 2022 as a host, and so, Colin works at Platformatic now, right? So we have to, because tech move in tech, it moves so fast that by the time you organize an event, uh, things change. So Colin, please introduce yourself. Uh, and then we will start uh, with a uh, presentation that has the name, type, the name is title as the event. So the state of the Node.js core. Please, Colin, introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Colin Urig. I, like uh, Francesco said, I am a software engineer at Platformatic. Uh, I've been working on the Node.js project for, I don't know, going on 10 years now. Um, also work on LibUV, um, HappyJS, some other random Node projects. Yeah, I'm excited to be here and talk about Node today. Yeah, absolutely. We, you, you will hear a lot of talking about Node today, probably. So, um, Colin, when you're ready, okay, we can start sharing these uh, uh, slides, like the platformatic uh, theme. I also love the profile picture, of course. Uh, there's also a story behind that. If you want to know more, you can just drop a question. So, Colin, when you're ready, I can uh, leave you the stage and then we can start, if that's okay for you. <clears throat> yeah, I'm ready when you are. Perfect, perfect. See you in the chat and see you in about 25 minutes. Bye and best of luck. Bye bye. Thank you. Okay, so uh, yeah, the, the name of the talk is the state of the Node.js core. Um, I'm Colin Erig. I have my, my GitHub handle and, and Twitter handle here if you're interested in seeing what I'm up to. Uh, so let's dive right in. Um, first thing to point out is that Node.js is, is still popular. Uh, so the chart here is um, plotting the number of total downloads from Node.js.org. Uh, I have a link here to the where the source data comes from. It's not in a nice chart form. I had to kind of format that myself. Um, but you can see that downloads are still consistently going up and to the right. Um, there are two gaps there in the graph. Um, those kind of correspond to the, the Christmas and New Year holidays um, when people hopefully aren't doing a lot of work. Uh, so the ecosystem is still really doing well also. Um, so again, I have some data here from modulecounts.com. Uh, the, the, the line that is much, much higher than all of the other lines is uh, NPM. Uh, so this, these are the total number of modules on NPM um, compared to everything else. Uh, again, you know, it's the largest uh, package ecosystem in the world. 
Uh, it does include more than just Node.js modules, so you can kind of publish anything to NPM. Um, and you know, not all modules on NPM are high quality modules, but it still is just kind of a proxy metric for how the ecosystem is doing. So the next thing I wanted to touch on, um, which will be kind of important for this talk, is Node's long-term support schedule. Um, so we have this chart. It's available on the, on the website, um, so you can always go and look at it. You can also, there's a module that I wrote some time back that can be used to generate this chart if you ever you know, felt the need to do that. Um, but basically, starting from the top, we have uh, the main branch. So this is where all the development inside of Node.js happens on GitHub. Um, and so everything lands there, whether it's a patch, uh, a new feature, or, or you know, a really breaking change. Um, and then for all the different release lines, we, we maintain separate branches that we then cherry pick the appropriate commits from main onto. Um, and so we, we generally break down the, the, the release lines into even and odd numbers. So the even numbered releases um, come out in uh, April and uh, those ones are what's known as the current release for about six months. Um, during that time, you know, everything except breaking changes comes from the main branch back to, to those release lines. Uh, after, they be, after they're done being the current release, they go into what's called active LTS, where, um, you know, they get fewer commits, um, but, you know, there's still a lot of things being backported there. And then finally, after I think it's a year of LTS, then they go into 18 months of maintenance mode, where it's really just you know the most essential patches getting down, getting backported. Um, and the idea is by having all these release lines overlap, it gives people plenty of time to you know start upgrading to the next release line while one is still supported. Uh, the odd number of releases, which come out in October, become the current release line for six months. Then they go into a very brief maintenance period, um, and then they become end of life. Um, so these are, you know, they, they never become actual LTS releases, and they generally should not be used for production. Um, but it is nice to still have these releases so that, you know, you don't have to queue up a major release just once a year. Uh, so as of what's going on right now, um, you'll see after the main branch, we have Node.js 14. That actually just reached its end of life at the end of April. Um, so if you're using that, absolutely get off of it as soon as possible. It's not going to get any security patches or, or anything else at all. Um, then we have Node 16. Uh, I'll talk about that a little bit more in, in a few minutes here. Um, but it is in maintenance mode, and it's actually in a shorter than usual maintenance mode. Um, so you know, if you're using Node 16, again, prepare to, to start migrating. Uh, Node, Node 18 is the current active LTS release. Uh, this is you know, what you really should be using if you're, if you're using Node in production. Uh, Node 19 uh, just recently started its short maintenance period. And you know, I, I think within a month, it will be end of life. Uh, and then we have Node 20, which just came out. So it's now the, the current release. Uh, and then you know, come fall time, Node 21 will be released, and or I'm sorry, I guess I shouldn't say fall time, uh, October, depending on what your what hemisphere you're in, it might not be fall. Um, but yeah, come October, it'll move into active LTS, and then Node 21 will be released, and it'll become the new current branch. Uh, so just you know, talking about Node 14, as I said, it is end of life. It was known by the Fermium code, da code name. Um, so all of the LTS releases get a, a code name from the periodic table of elements. Um, some elements don't have actual uh, uh, element, or some there are some letters that don't have actual element names. So in that case, we just kind of make them up, um, and we go in alphabetical order. So Node four was the first one. It was uh, uh, what was it? Not argon maybe, and then uh, si node six was boron and, and so on and so on. Um, but yeah, so node 14 was end of life at the end of April. There will be no more releases even for security uh, issues. If you're on it, start migrating off now and I suggest going for node 18. So node 16 um, is known by the gallium code name. Uh, so it's end of life, life is September 11th, 2023. Normally it would go end of life in April of 2024. However, uh, we did decide to, to you know, cut it short by seven months to correspond with the version of OpenSSL that is shipped with Node 16. Um, so that version of OpenSSL is going to go end of life as well. Uh, it would be a breaking change to try to upgrade OpenSSL in Node 16. And at that point, being that close to the end of life, um, you know, we figured 
you know, instead of shipping a breaking change or having people running Node 16 um, with an insecure version of OpenSSL, it'd be better to just end of life it. So start migrating off of it now. Again, aim for Node 18. Uh, if you want to read all of the details about the end of life, um, you know, I have the, the blog post linked here at the bottom of the slide. Uh, so next, I want to talk about Node 18. So it's going by the hydrogen code name. Uh, it's currently our active LTS release. It's going to go into maintenance mode in October of 2023 and should be end of life if everything goes according to plan in April of 2025. Uh, so it's very stable at this point. You have, you know, if you're able to get your code migrated to Node 18, you have a long time that you can kind of, you know, sit on Node 18 and, and enjoy the stability and, and focus on, you know, whatever it is you, that you do for your business logic. Um, and yeah, this is my personal recommendation for, for running in production. So Node 19 was originally released in October of last year. Um, as I said earlier, it will not enter LTS um, and it'll be end of life in June of 2023. So I do not recommend using this in production. Um, even if you were using it in production, it'll be end of life soon. So you know, if you're using it, migrate away. Um, one thing that's very notable here is that uh, Dtrace, System Tap, and ETW uh, support was removed in this release. Uh, sorry, my, my little red X picture kind of moved over on its own there. Um, so these were kind of used for, for uh, debugging and tracing and things like that. Um, the problem was it's an open source project. Nobody was actually maintaining them and they were becoming a bit of a, a maintenance burden. So uh, we did remove them. Uh, there is an issue open, I believe, uh, if anyone is feeling like adding them back and, and wants to support them. Um, but yeah, open source projects, we, we can't do everything, uh, everything that we want to all of the time. So then I wanted to show you just a graph. Um, this is the same data that I showed in the first chart of the presentation, but broken down by Node.js version. Uh, Node 20 is not included here because it's still you know, so new. It would just be a, a little blip in the, the bottom right-hand corner. Um, but you can see the, the blue bar uh, that is kind of raising at the beginning of, of the chart and then kind of beginning to drop off. That is Node 14. Um, so that is expected. Uh, node 16 came out. We want to see people migrating away from node 14. So it does look like that's the case. Uh, node 16 at this point is, is still the most popular version. Um, but, you know, hopefully with a little more time, that'll start to drop off and node 18 will overtake it. Uh, the yellow is node 18. You can see where it you know, came into the world um, and then slowly started to pick up. Uh, node 17 is not included here because it's already end of life. Um, and then node 19 is the little green squiggle at the end. So um, just a breakdown by version. And you know, we this is generally the pattern we want to see. So it would be nice to revisit this in a few months. And hopefully node 14 will be almost gone. Node 16 will be dwindling. And node 18 will, and 20 will really be picking up. Uh, so a lot of people have asked, you know, how do they pick which version they should run in production? Uh, the, the generic answer is you should always be running an LTS release. Um, you know, the reason is the, the current releases, they get all of the patches and, and bug fix and new features from, from the main branch, um, but sometimes breaking changes do slip through. Um, and we have our LTS set up the way that it is so that, um, you know, uh, when a new commit goes out into the current release, it has to bake before it's actually backported to LTS. So we, we get this time of, of seeing people actually using the feature and making sure that it's not breaking people um, before we backport it to LTS. So that is kind of the, the, the key difference in why LTS is so much more stable and recommended. Um, you know, some people are always going to want the newest features. Um, most people don't have an actual business case for that. So as developers, we like to play with the, the latest and greatest features. Um, but you, you really need to sit and ask yourself if it's something you actually need or something you would just like to have. Um, and then the other thing is, can you update easily and frequently? So, you know, if you're going to run the current release in production, uh, you have to be a little more nimble. So, you know, there's a, there could be a chance of a breaking change. Uh, there are more frequent releases and, and things like that. So you, you know, if it's really, if it's really difficult for you to upgrade your Node version, or your business really depends on on Node.js, then I definitely would suggest that uh, that you stick with LTS. 
So next, I wanted to talk about some of the new features uh, that have landed recently from, from V8 and from, I guess, uh, the JavaScript uh, language spec. Uh, so Shadow Realms are, are a thing. Um, if you've ever used Node's VM module, it's kind of similar to that, but, but specified at the language level. Um, so they're still experimental in V8. So for Node to expose them, we added an experimental Shadow Realm feature. So you can start Node up with that CLI flag, and then Shadow Realms will be enabled, and you can you can play around with them. Uh, there are a couple new uh, array methods, so find last and find last index. Um, there are also recently some new array methods that are going to be in the spec uh, for doing things like sorting and, and things like that uh, that aren't covered here. Uh, there's also some some new uh, APIs around internationalization, if that's something that's important to you. Uh, one very important thing is improved performance for class fields and methods. Um, so, when when private class fields first came out, um, you know it was something that everybody wanted, but we couldn't really leverage them that much because uh, they still came with a significant performance hit, which you know is kind of typical for for new V8 features. Uh, they get released and then have to go through some optimization period and whatnot. Um, but so those are now they're optimized. Uh, the performance is now on par with using something like a symbol to to hide your your uh, class fields. Um, so you know feel free to use those. Um, and then JavaScript promise integration is going to be something that's really big for people who are using WebAssembly. Um, so Right now, everything in WebAssembly is more or less synchronous. Um, and so sometimes you want to call back into your JavaScript code. But if that code is asynchronous, then there's kind of a, an impedance mismatch in the, the you know, JavaScript and WebAssembly doesn't really work well together in that case. Um, but with the promise integration, that, that changes things. It lets you then use asynchronous code in JavaScript with your WebAssembly a lot easier. Uh, so Node does take web platform compatibility uh, very seriously. Um, you know, increasingly over the years, we've added more and more uh, web platform APIs, and that is a trend that is not going to be stopping anytime soon. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to list out everything here, but uh, some of the big ones are Fetch. Um, Fetch comes with some, some fee, uh, objects of its own, like request and response and form data and things like that. Uh, we have web streams, uh, which is kind of the web platform's answer to node streams. Um, and then we have actually some APIs that allow you to convert between no, uh, web streams and node streams to make things a little easier to use. Uh, web crypto, which is the web platform's API, the web platform's answer to uh, node's crypto API. Um, structured clone, which is really nice for being able to make copies of objects and, and, and things like that. Um, so yeah, I, I suggest, you know, play around with some of these APIs and, and give us feedback. Uh, tell us about any bugs that you find. Uh, the next thing I wanted to talk about that was new in Node 18 and just became stable in Node 20 is the test runner. Um, so uh, this, this one excites me a little bit because I worked on this myself. Um, but we have a new Node colon test module. Um, the Node colon part is important, and I'll talk about it in a minute. Um, but it is a, a top-level core module you can import and use to write tests. Um, and then there is a test runner. So if you start Node with a dash dash test flag, um, it'll actually run all of your test files and you know give you a nice report at the end. Um, some people actually backported the the code from Node Core to a npm module called test. Um, so you can go out and use that. That's for compatibility with older versions of Node. So you, you probably won't need it very much at this point, um, but it is there if you if you need it. Uh, so it supports all the you know big things you would you would expect out of a test runner. So uh, skipping tests, divining subtests, uh, lifecycle hooks. So before, before each, after, and things like that. Um, we do have built-in support for mocking. Um, we have built-in experimental uh, code coverage. Um, we recently added test reporters as well, so you can specify a test reporter. Um, so, you know, do you want to output TAP, which stands for the Test Anything Protocol? Um, do you want to output something that's a little more human friendly and things like that? Uh, and then there's a test reporter destination flag that can, you know, kind of tell you tell the test runner where to send that output. Um, so, by default. Uh, if you're using a TTY as your as your terminal window or whatever your your standard in to um, to Node.js, uh, you'll get spec, which is a nice human readable format um, over standard out. If you're not on a TTY, it'll default to using tap over um, 
also on standard out, which is something that's a little more machine readable and can be consumed by other tools. Um, so I, I did say that, you know, um, we could write basic tests with this thing. So here's two examples. One is the first is a synchronous test. Uh, the second is asynchronous. So you can use an async function, return a promise, whatever. Um, we use nodes assert module here to, to do the assertions. So the test runner does not ship with its own assertion module. You can use nodes assert module or anything else that will throw an exception whenever, whenever an assertion fails. Uh, so this is what the output of those tests would look like. On the left, we have TAP, which, as I said, is you know more, more machine readable, uh, versus on the right, uh, the spec uh, reporter, which is more human readable. Um, so I did mention earlier that the node colon part of the, the test module was important. Um, starting with the test runner and probably moving forward with all new core modules, uh, the node colon prefix on the, the, the module name is actually required. So at the top, you can see we're importing node test and node assert versus at the bottom, we're importing assert and test. Um, so in both cases, you'll get the same assertion module. Um, all, all node core modules can be used with or without the, the node colon prefix, except for test. Um, if you don't use the node colon, you'll get test loaded from your from node modules or user land or you know wherever it would normally uh, import from uh, so that is an important thing to realize um, and like i said moving forward as new core modules are added this is probably the way things are going to continue to work uh, we also added watch mode recently so you can run with dash dash watch from the command line um, and it'll be similar to doing something like nodemon um, and so it'll watch all of your imported files and it'll restart node when any of those change. Uh, and it is integrated directly with the test runner. So you can make some changes and it will automatically rerun uh, your tests for you. Uh, you can specify exactly which, which uh, files you want to watch if it's not doing the right thing or you have some custom use case. Um, although the watch path currently is for Mac OS and Windows only. So that's a, a little caveat. Uh, in Node 20, we also stabilized util.parse args. So if you've ever used things like Commander or Minimist um, to write little CLI utilities, um, there's now this parse args in core that you know, can do more or less the same thing for you. Um, this is nice because you know anyone who was writing a command line tool had to import your args or any of the other ones. And uh, yeah, it's just nice to have this built into core. Um, please check it out and you know, let us know what you think of it. Another big one is single executable applications. Um, so what this does is it lets you bundle up your Node.js application into a single binary and distribute that. The reason it's nice is because, um, you know, say your user doesn't have Node and NPM installed on their system. They would have to download Node, make sure their package manager is set up an NPM install to, to you know, get your application and run it. Um, and so that just, it cuts out a bunch of steps for people who aren't interested in having Node installed. Um, so I, I do have to say this was originally developed at Postman Labs and they were kind enough to donate it to the project. Um, it uses a little helper module called Postject. Um, there are similar tools to Postject. Uh, we don't test those ones, but they should work. Um, Currently, you can only bundle up a single common JS file. Um, so, you know, if you really wanted to ship your entire application, you would have to run it through a bundler first, and then, you know, the output common JS file you could uh, then distribute as a single executable. Uh, we do plan to improve that as as time goes on. Uh, another thing that was recently added is a permission system. So, there are a set of command line flags and runtime APIs for kind of uh, defining and uh, looking, like inspecting what the permission system is. Um, so dash dash experimental permission is what enables the permission system to begin with. Once that is enabled, then you need to specifically opt into allowing uh, FS read or write operations, allowing child process uh, access, allowing worker threads to be created. Um, I'm pretty sure it also uh, uh, disables compiled add-ons by default. Uh, and so all these things you need to then, you know, uh, grant access if you want to use them. Um, the runtime API, there's uh, process.permission.has, and it'll tell you if you have this you know, fs.write permission, for example. 
Um, you can also get more granular, so you can you can set things on individual paths. So say, for example, I wanted to know if I can write to slash home slash user, I can actually inspect that programmatically. Um, and the same functionality is available from the command line. Uh, there was a process.permission.deny. We decided to remove that. We're going to possibly revisit it. Um, so you know, depending on what version of Node you're looking at, that may or may not be there. Uh, some other notable changes. Um, there's a new URL parser that's that's significantly faster. Uh, startup snapshot API is improving. Um, available parallelism, if you've ever used Rust, um, it's a nice alternative to looking at how many CPUs you have. Um, what else? Streams helpers I had already mentioned, so converting between web and node streams. Uh, happy eyeballs for, for doing DNS lookups. Um, there was an assert.snapshot for doing snapshot testing that we briefly added. That was removed because people were kind of you know, up in the air about the API. So I do expect that that will come back one day, though. Uh, some other things that might be coming down the road. Uh, there's some work going on for a foreign function interface. Uh, so if you've ever used Node API um, for doing compiled add-ons, um, this is kind of an alternative take on that. Um, we're also looking at a, a way to better incorporate TypeScript without actually shipping TypeScript because um, TypeScript doesn't really follow Semver. And so for something like an LTS release that has to be supported for years, uh, we, I feel like we would probably get into a lot of trouble there. Um, so we're, we're looking at ways to better support it. Um, so keep an eye out there. Uh, quick or HTTP3, whatever you want to call it. Um, there's you know, active development going on there. It's been going on for a couple of years now. Uh, for fetch, we're looking to add the HTTP proxy environment variable, uh, more promisified core modules, and then just you know, general you know, smaller features that uh, you know, people will ask for on the issue tracker. So um, I just wanted to close with some important links. Um, so if you have a bug report or a feature request, uh, the place to do that is on GitHub, node.js slash node. That's the, the main core repo. Uh, if you have a support question, so you're wondering why your application is not doing something, you're not quite sure that it's a bug, uh, there's the node.js slash help repo. That's the perfect place to ask questions. Think of it as kind of like a, a stack overflow. Um, we also have discussions enabled, so you can, you can ask things there. Um, if you want to know about the release schedule that I talked about earlier, there's node.js slash release. Uh, that has the chart that I showed earlier, as well as you know more important dates and uh, things formatted as JSON files, so you can inspect them programmatically and things like that. Uh, if you found a security issue, the place to report that is not on the public uh, GitHub issue tracker. Uh, so we do use HackerOne. So if you go to hackerone.com/slash Node.js, uh, you can you can report your security vulnerabilities there. And then finally on Slack. Um, there's, we're, we're active in the OpenJS Foundation Slack instance. So uh, there's a link here for an invite. Uh, you can go to the Node.js channel to talk generally about Node.js or Node.js core channel if you want to talk more about um, you know, core development. Um, and that's everything I had for today. Um, just a, a quick shameless plug for Platformatic, the company that I'm working at, uh, making APIs in Node.js easy to develop out of the box. And that is everything I had. Thanks, everyone. Perfect. Thank you so much, Colin. I also ch checked the Platformatic uh, by myself with Matteo. And um, yes, so uh, thank you. We have uh, we don't have much time, so let's go faster with the questions, if that's uh, OK for you. So first of all, uh, something super fast that usually people ask, uh, will the, the slides will be available and where? This is a question by me. Uh, yeah, so I, I have I keep them in a private GitHub repo, but um, I mean I can I can put them on Dropbox and, and distribute them that way. Check my Twitter, I guess. Okay, okay. So follow him on Twitter, so you'll know more. Uh, let's go. Let's go here. So best way for uh, for package authors to support both the ESM and CJS. Uh, that's the million dollar question. <laughs> so it's it's still. A difficult process, I think. Um, I mean, you can you can dual publish, so you can um, you can publish a module that has like an ESM implementation uh, as well as a common JS implementation. And uh, usually, the way I've seen that done is that you you, know, you you pick one, 
whether you want to write it in ESM or, or common JS, and then you just kind of create a, a small wrapper file that then exports the same functionality for the other module system. Thank you. So not, not big changes here. I can say, um, yes, about, uh, yeah, uh, so Graham asked this uh, while you were talking about especially this part. So I don't know if you want uh, to add something on, uh, is there any situation where you can add, use uh, odd numbered versions or you'd recommend to never use them? So they're there, but we don't use them. Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, it, it's a little bit harsh to say never <laughs> use them. They're, they are stable. They're good releases. Um, for the most part, there's nothing wrong with them. Um, it's just, you know, it's how, how much risk can you, can you take? Um, you know, if it's a project that if you have a little bit of downtime and there's a bad release, you're fine. Like I said, if, if your company, it's mission critical, you can't afford downtime, you're making money through Node.js, then you probably want to stick to the, the even number, but the, the odd number of releases are, you know, they are fine. Um, you're, Knock on wood, probably not going to have any problems if you use them. But out of extreme caution, I have to recommend using LTS. Nice. Uh, thank you. Uh, let's go with the next one. Um, how to handle uh, Biloba? How to handle incompatibilities with applications when I use a node version that is newer compared to a version like sixteen dot something? So maybe I think it like it for a minor release. Uh, I use MVM, so how to handle different versions? Um, I'm, I'm assuming he means like if a feature is not available in an older version. Um, so, you know, one way is you can define the, the ranges that you're going to support and stick to that. Um, another thing, you know, if you've done development in the browser is you can uh, often get away with doing like feature detection. Um, so you can check if an API exists and then only use it then, uh, possibly use a fallback. Um, another option is if you're doing things with NPM modules, there are optional dependencies. So, um, you know, try to install a dependency. If something fails and that module is not available, then you, you use a fallback or something like that. Um, so th there are different options out there. Um, I find the easiest one is to just define a range of what you're going to support and stick to that. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. I think we have one or max two more Then we have to invite uh, uh, Matteo. Um, stand, will the web standard APIs will replace the current node uh, libs? So replace as in new code should be written with it, yes. Um, but you know we have all of these all of this legacy code out there that people are no longer maintaining or have you know abandoned or whatever, um, and it might be buried you know several levels deep in your node modules folder. So you know we have uh, we have a stability index in node. We have like experimental, stable, deprecated. Um, we recently added um, a new a new index called uh, legacy, and so what that basically means is. You know, there's a new, better alternative. We're not going to take this away from you like we might if it's deprecated. Um, but, you know, if you see that it's legacy, you should probably look for better alternatives. Um, and so, you know, these new web APIs are a perfect example of that. Nice. Uh, thank you, uh, Colin. Maybe we can go with the very last one. Uh... This one by Graham. Uh, is Quick the replacement alternative for TCP? Or not? Uh, it's it's not a, a replacement, and I believe Quick uses UDP. Um, it's you know it's another tool in the toolbox as far as, as networking goes. So um, you know you can use it. You don't have to use it. Uh, it'll you'll probably get better performance once it's there and stabilized and optimized. Um, but but TCP is not going to go anywhere. Nice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Colin. So now it's time to invite Matteo. So thank you so much. If you if you yeah. still have time, I'll invite you at the end. But the, by the way, we have the you can follow him on Twitter. We left a, a link in the description. So best of luck, Colin. And yes, see you soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Okay. So now it's time. So finally. Matteo, how are you? I see that you are still there. So you are muted, Hello, but you are still there. I am still that's, there. Okay, that's the minor of the of the issues. So 
Matteo is an inspiration for me because uh, my very first uh, talk as an attendee, it was one of his talks at the Code Emotion in 2018. I keep repeating this uh, since forever. So now it seems strange that we're here, like I'm a host in the Lidev and we are a speaker here. We're also collaborating on my YouTube channel. So I don't know, things have changed a lot uh, in the last years. Um, yes, Matteo is super knowledgeable, uh, super funny. Uh, we met in person in London. So but I think we didn't, for, we didn't get a selfie together. So we have to fix this. Maybe we did it. Or we did that, I forgot. So Matteo, please uh, uh, introduce yourself uh, and then you can get started with your presentation. Want to share your screen. Perfect. OK. Are you there? So yeah yeah i'm here can you hear me yeah so uh yeah. folks uh, everybody i uh, something that might happen here it's uh, uh something that might happen is that my power goes away my internet goes away and i suddenly disappear because the area of italy where i live is currently under very heavy rain and there are floods everywhere everywhere so if power goes out if internet goes out if a baby start crashing in the in the room because it's the world is coming to an end, I don't know. I'm just if I disappear, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm just I'm just putting a big disclaimer up front. So <laughs> nice. it's uh, if things go bad, it's not my fault. So hopefully I'll try to reconnect, but you know, let's, uh, um, nice. let's try to not to, to not to not break it. So I'm so glad to be here. Uh, here as there are my slides, and here we go. Sorry, I should I should share my screen, right? You know, this seems if you seems want a, seems, seems something are. that I should be I should be doing. <clears throat> so it is the same. Sure yeah, yeah, you can show okay. it. Yeah. So nice. So yeah. great. Okay. So yeah, this is uh, I'm so happy to be here. This talk has been a blast all over the conference that have done it. And I'm so so glad to be here at the daily.dev to show it to all of you. If you haven't watched it yet, if you if you do, I'm sorry. I'm going to include some more spicy things in here. Just to, you know, I change stuff every single time, you know. So before before we start, uh, I will not mention names, but I almost lost uh, Matteo as a friend because once I made an article using an ORM, I'll not mention name. I almost lost his friendship. So we are still here. We had I, we had to clarify. But uh, I like these bold statements. Uh, and uh, to be honest, I'm really looking forward for this presentation. Before we start, Matteo, super fast, we made an exception because we have a question here. I think it's this for you. Do you think Fastify will get over Express? Oh, <laughs> super fast. <laughs> so it is the gist. Nobody's getting over Express. Express is there. It's super legacy at this point. This might take two cents. And there are so many articles out there that covers Express, so much content. So you can't really get over Express in that sense, OK? Uh, will eventually become as big as Express? Hopefully so, OK? But I don't think anybody can uh, uh, replace Express on that sense, because it's so much content is published on it that makes it uh, very easy for people to start a new project. If uh, Are you starting a new project with Node? I would recommend not to use Express. Uh, uh, use Fastify, use Koa, use uh, Happy, okay? Use one of those. You're going to be fine uh, with, with any of them. They are all actively maintained. It's great. Um, so, yeah, that's my two cents. Nice. So thank you. Sorry for the for cutting a couple of minutes, but this was, uh, I think, a good a good question. Oh, question it's a good question. You. So I have more yeah. to say, but I'm keeping nice. it private at the moment. But yeah. Perfect. Good. Best of luck, uh, Matteo. And uh, yeah, see you hopefully <laughs> later. <laughs> yeah, hopefully, 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 hopefully. <laughs> so hi, folks. Very happy to be here at the Monthly Dev talking about Platformatic, ORMs, Node, all things possible that you want to be hearing from me. I was just coding like three minutes ago, so I need to focus a little bit on this presentation probably. Anyway, so uh, a little bit about me. Uh, what do I do? Um, what do I do? First of all, I need to put my phone in silent mode because it seems things are getting very disturbing. Cool. So um, what happens? Wh what I do, uh, I'm the co-founder of this company called Platformatic. Uh, check us out. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about what we do later on. Uh, more importantly for you, I'm part of the Node.js Technical Steering Committee. Um, I am part of the security team that triage vulnerabilities for Node. 
So if from never now and then you need to force update all your node stuff, please do. This is probably my, partially my fault. I am sorry. Or not. Not sorry. Sorry, not sorry. Uh, I am also part of the people maintaining the HTTP stack. I And in fact, I, uh, I a long time ago, I, I laid out a plan to ship fetch a node, and it actually happened. <laughs> so, you know, it's it's uh, um, uh, this was kind of impressive, OK? And we had got streams. I'm maintaining node streams. Again, uh, these are not going away. And focusing also on diagnostic, a lot of bunch of other stuff. So anyway, uh, I'm also a board member of the OpenJS Foundation. So uh, um, my software is running on your computer. So I don't want to care too much. And subscribe to my newsletter or whatever. So I'm going to talk about ORMs and object relational mapping. So how many of you use Java? OK. How many of you use Java? I don't. I don't know. I hope you not so many. Or maybe some of you have used Java in the past. I know Francesco did. So um, anyway, uh, what does an ORM promise you? Uh, ORM promises us a, a, a very neat box, OK, and a very neat code base. Oh, you are mapping all your tables with these models. Everything will be fine. Put all your business logic in the models, what we call them fat models, and everything will be good and fine and nice and easy and simpler to maintain. Yeah. So, do you know what happens when your application to your application when it uses our ORM? No. Well, it hibernates, and if you have not used Java, you would not get this joke. So, let's talk a little bit about the power of uh, the 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 problem uh, of the ORMs, and the the problem here lays in the concept of the model. So, most implementation of ORMs have this concept. So typically, you define your, you have a class. You say that you have a class quote that extends a model. You can just alter the API, but more or less, this is kind of the same thing that you're going to do. And every model are typically three responsibilities. You have the maintenance of the, the managing the persistency. So you have a save, a delete, a find over there. Uh, you It holds all the data in memory. So typically, it might even have a two JSON thing. And then you also use the models to implement business logic. Yeah, that's the problem. It actually adds too much stuff. Okay. You know, you have probably heard about the single responsibility principle or Unix, you know, and this thing completely blows it away. It's not a good abstraction for almost anything. Sorry to, to say this loud. Um, you don't want to mix your these three things together. You don't want them. Okay, you don't want them in the same piece of code. You want in three different pieces of code. So this is the problem with ORMs. Okay. So what do we do about it? And why also this is a problem? Oh, that this is sorry, I can hide this. Okay. Um, so the problem comes from this phenomenal architecture called the model view controller architecture. That was uh, it actually made super sense when it was invented in uh, by Smalltalk for desktop applications. Completely doesn't make much sense in, in the world of web, unfortunately, and I'm sorry. Um, so basically, in the world of in the world of web, you have uh, three places where you need to put a feature. You have models, views, and controllers. And well, do you still use views? You know, do you have views? Have a folder of views in your applications? So possibly no. It's gone. So no more views. I'm sorry. Views, you were nice. Bye. So you have controllers and models and a database. And so if you need to write up a functionality for your application, you typically go and either you put it in a controller or a model. Ouch, we are in trouble now. So if I need to complete the team grows and there's a lot of functionality in your app, you soon you will have 2,000 models in your app. By the way, this is actually real. There are companies with 2,000 models in their or 2,000 tables in their database, OK? Think about that. Think if that code base is easy to maintain. I don't think that code base is easy to maintain. In fact, that code base is more or less a big block of spaghetti code. And um, in fact, I would claim that ORM delivered a nice ball of spaghetti code since the 90s, which when were they were invented. So you want some spaghetti code? Here it is. Use your ORM. And I love my carbonara. We can talk about carbonara recipes, to be honest, if you want. So when you want, let's, go, let's have a chat about Carbonara. So OK, fast forward a few years. I have created this tag called Fastify. And Fastify offers a slightly different way to approach that uh, model view controller problem. 
And in fact, it allows you to structure your application more or less using Node.js modules at your base level of abstractions so that you could actually structure your applications in much more of a horizontal way so that you don't have formal um, uh, controllers and formal models, but you can structure them by features. So wrap your things, your, your business logic by features. So you have your product logic, you have your order logic, you have your cart logic. Oh, fun. OK, so now you can actually encapsulate all of those in different boxes. And those boxes communicate each other via API, not via joins and database queries. So in this way, you can actually scale your app and make things go very, um, you know, do not find yourself in, in a app situation with just a blob of um, spaghetti code. So, and by the way, other frameworks can, you can use other frameworks for that too, not just Fastify, but, you know, it makes it simpler for me. So, uh, so what happens is also that with that kind of structure, you can easily migrate that into microservice if you want to. Amazing. So, why does it all matter for us, and why it matter for um, for you? Okay, Pareto, a mathematician in in the, the beginning of the last century that was a little bit of a fascist. So, don't talk a little bit about the fascism, but let's talk about what he did for his contribution to the to science was a mathematician and a statistician. So, okay, Pareto uh, theorized that 80% of the outcomes come from 20% of all causes for any given event. So, oh, this sounds long and complicated. So it means that only 20%, and the numbers are completely, you know, casual to some extent, are here and they go into the 80%. Okay, so, and this only matter for this tiny bit. Ouch. What does it mean for us? Well, for software, okay, and a lot of people will tell you the same thing. They tell you that, you know, um, uh, 80, you can ship 80% uh, of the feature with only 20% of the effort. Whoa, it's amazing, right? And 20% of the feature will require 80% of the effort. So do you remember when this thing first came out, the first iPhone? Okay, when the first iPhone came out, you had, uh, it did not ship, copy and paste. Look, copy and paste. You would get copy and paste for granted in any operating system out there, right? But, yeah, no, first iPhone did not have copy and paste and every single person joked about them not having copy and paste. And yeah, implementing copy and paste across an operating system is freaking hard. And you can ask all people that have used Linux for a long time, that will tell you how hard it was at the beginning to set up copy and paste on the operating system. So that said, you know, it's kind of true, okay? So what do we do then? So given that the numbers are completely hypothetical, right? We could essentially optimize our application so that uh, we can, uh, you know, optimize our, our application to ship uh, um, faster, Okay, um, and to ship faster, what? The complex features or the easy features at the start of the project? And in some cases, you know, um, I want to ship faster at the beginning of the project and I don't care if I take a huge amount of technical debt, but somebody will probably come back and pay it back for me or maybe not and then I'm screwed. Or maybe I want to optimize for the complex features, okay? the one that take 80% of the effort in a given project, but you know, it's only, you know, 20% of them is the hard one. They are the hard ones. So, you know, and eventually every single one of us will need to go and implement those complex features. So, and this is the kind of the reason why in, when you see your projects, uh, you know, you see that the, the, the velocity of your project goes down. The more, the longer the project lasts, the, 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 the longer, the, the, the slower it gets. Okay, I've seen projects like degrading over time, degrading over time, degrading over time to the point that cannot ship anything anymore. Literally, no new features for one year. Uh, they were only doing maintenance. Yeah, you know, very hard. So what happens? Um, so when you took to choose to choose a technology, then what would you choose? Would you choose a technology that removes all the repetitive tasks or you choose a framework that enables maximum flexibility? And should you choose one of the two? Okay, and for me, the pragmatic choice is the framework to enable the most complex features. 
because if I do that, I am pretty sure that can handle anything that comes my way. If I take something that removes all the repetitive tasks, I can look, I can ship a bare, bare minimum MVP of my application by using no code tools. So I can just do that. Then the feature that can the code, no code tool can, can do uh, uh, is required. And then I'm pretty much screwed and I need to implement everything from scratch. So I don't know. I'm just making a very, you know, top of the line example, like, you know, uh, ex an extreme example, but these can be, there are very degrees of this stuff. Okay. On the other hand, I just said, oh, I'm not using any framework at all. And I have maximum flexibility because I'm just coding in, uh, in Wasm. Not, 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 not the, 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 like I'm putting down the binary Wasm code and that's it. That's what I'm doing. So I don't know. I'm just putting top and top and bottom. So. The problem with ORMs and why I, I, I say that I will never use an ORM is that ORMs typically removes the easy part, okay? Typically, when you do an ORM, use an ORM, you write your migration, you define your schema, you apply the migration, you set up your ORMs, you write your models, and then you expose your models as router solvers and so on and so forth. But then eventually, you will have to write some custom SQL and code to deal with very hard business logic in every single case. Typical cases, ORMs might not implement joins very well. This is one of the typical cases where ORMs fall flat. Like they cannot, they have very, very, very hard time in implementing joins and implementing complex joins and using your database as its best. So you should be using your, your database and learn your database to do the best it can do, okay, to the best they can do. And the ORMs shields you from the database. So you have your database. Oh, I have this amazing toy. And it can do all sorts of things, kind of a transformer, right? Can take different shapes and I can do a lot of those things. And then you use, oh, no, 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 no. I don't, I, I don't want all of that. I just want to, you know, um, use the Macar to drive to take a coffee. You know, mm, might not be. Okay. Anyway, that's my take. So um, Typically, the best line of code is the one that I don't have to write. And I really love this keyboard. This is the second edition of that keyboard. So anyway, this is nice. So typically, I want to have the cake and eat the cake at the same time, which it's hard, right? I, 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 don't, I want to have a framework that solves all the easy problems for me and doesn't do all the other stuff. And it leaves me maximum flexibility. So what can I do? So yes, this is what I have been doing for the last um, year, something like that. And this is almost a year, not even a year. Whoa, it seems ages that I've been working on this stuff. Platformatic. So this is what we, are, we have been developing so far. And the tool that I'm going to talk about is Platformatic DB. We are doing a lot of other stuff. In fact, I released this at the beginning of last September. So we have been busy implementing a lot of other things. So check us out. What do Platformatic, what Platformatic DB allow you? Well, Platformatic DB takes your schema in your database and then generates uh, URLs and um, routes and resolvers and GraphQL schemas and open API and so on and so forth for you. So you have to do no CRUD. It just comes out of the box. And well, at, and it gets completely out of the way when you just want to write your custom SQL and code to deal with that, the custom business logic. So best of both worlds. How does it do that? Well. It, it's built on top of Fastify. We talked a little bit about Fastify before. Fastify, it's an enabled super nice plugin system that enable you to load different functionality in. So Platformatic DB uh, offer, uh, allows you to load uh, a full-blown Platformatic uh, Fastify plugin within your code. And you can access all the other things that are available in, um, in, in, our, in our ecosystem. So you could just take the SQL mapper, for example, and use our, our very easy mapper. But look, use SQL. Use the power of your database. Don't go and be shy and use um, uh, and just use the, the high level interface. Use the low level stuff. It's very important. So uh, you have some demo time uh, for this. Uh, hopefully, I'll, I don't know how much time I have. So um, I still, Francesco still hasn't kicked me out. So seems about right. I might go and do a little bit of a demo. So here it is. So I have monthly here and it's probably, yeah, it's daily. Yay, okay. So it's actually not monthly, it's daily. So I, I got I got wrong, it's daily. It's daily.dev, okay, so it's daily. 
Great. Uh, um, so what I can do, and if you want to create startup platformatic application, platformatic DB application, you can do npm create platformatic at latest. This will download the package from uh, from npm and install it and create run a little bit of a scaffolding thing that we've built for you to get started. Very easy. So you run it. Thank you, Francesco, for the times. And now it tells us what we want to create. And we want to create a DB project in this folder. We want a default migration, right? Default, default. I'm not going to use types here because it takes a little bit more time to install everything. And then we store some dependencies and, and so on. Cool. As usual, NPM, NPM takes a little bit of time. So in the meanwhile, I'm drinking some water. OK. It's still running. I hope it was faster. So I just stay there. Oh, if you want to come up in on the stage, yay! If I, hey, Francesco, hello. Yeah, yeah. I came here. So first of all, Matteo, you are crazy at starting a demo like it last five minutes. Yeah, I like, of course. I, I like okay. I like this approach, and we did this together. I did this. So with with Matteo uh, supervising. I remember. So we have, yes, a, we even have a cloud. We're not configuring it. We're not configuring the cloud now. So mm -hmm. it's uh, um, what we're going to do now is uh, npx platformatic db uh, start. These will. Oh, I have something running on my computer. So just a second. I, I made made a mistake. Um, so very quickly, and ouch, super bad. <laughs> Okay, let's do let's do something very easy. So what it has created, it has created a, I don't know what's running on that port, so I can just change it to 423. Good. So we have a .m file already supported, so you can configure everything here. Um, uh, and you can see that we have a, a .m file. And here we have the host name, the port, and some stuff using SQLite for our database. So we have a URL. So we can open this URL, and this goes in here. And here we go. Oops, sorry, I need to. Here we go. OK. So here, this is the starting point. You will see that it has both Open API and Graphical. And here we go. We have those two things. In Open API, you see that it has created a few routes for us, so slash movies. This is our default start. We have the get and head. Post, put, add movies, and so on and so forth. Pretty nice. You can even try this out. So this is, we have a lot of filters. You see, that's a lot of stuff you can ask for. But you can also just get all of them. And this is comes up because we haven't had anything. And with a graphical, this works as, as you would expect. So you can have a mutation. And you can save a movie and say input. And say the title of the movie. And say that I want Star Wars. And then you can get the ID of the movie. And then this is automatically um, saved. So anyway, just uh, I just don't want to bother you. There's full videos of me doing this demo, so I'm not going to do it again now um, because for brevity, I'm probably going, going to over, go over. So I just want to say there is a lot of features here like relations, uh, web sockets, and so on and so forth that can be very useful. It also comes with all the deep production default um, setups that you want to do for your app. So it has event loop protection, and a lot of other things that will make you your app safe to run out of the box. It under configs, it under all sorts of things. So anyway, uh, uh, finishing off. Uh, uh, um, as I said, this is all. Be oh, something that I didn't show you. Something very nice is that you can actually extend this very easily. So in here you have uh, this is just a Fastify plugin. You see, and these you can, for example, add a slash route. Actually, not this loud. Let's call it uh, daily dot dev and says and then the return. For example, ready. Is this your blog? Daily dot dev less blog. I think is I can't remember the exact uh, link, but you can put the daily daily dot dev. It's better than the blog. okay. So we are doing that <laughs> app dot daily dot dev. So we have we have put this in. So in here, if we go in here. If we refresh our Swagger now, you will see that there is this new get and head. OK, so I could say, I could try this and say daily.dev, and it is loads. Nice. I should okay. start putting links in my demos too, so it's good. <laughs> so anyway, it's, it's pretty nice. And 
uh, you can, as you can see, I've never, I have um, I just written my stuff. The, we have the nice live road experience that you are expecting from modern frameworks. You don't need to refresh. You don't need to do any of the stuff. You don't need to build this yourself. That's what I'm saying. Okay, it comes out of the box. So um, uh, going on and finishing this, and uh, here we go. Uh, and you can also, all of these is also based on plugins and Fastify components. So you can actually use this stuff on, by your, on, on its own. So you don't need to use our big runner if you don't like, you can just use our modules. And that's also a possibility for you. It also, these, because it has this custom plugin capability, you can actually very easily say, oh, I want to start with the CRUD scaffolding and then move away from it. And very quickly have a framework that supports you both doing all the repetitive tasks, but also gives you maximum flexibility. So the question for you is, did I code an ORM? And with that, I'm saying goodbye. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Matteo. We don't have time from the Q&A, but uh, you can check the chat uh, because we had Oh, Oh, there, there, there are a lot of questions. So, I'm so sorry. I missed the questions. There were, there were, some, there were some, I think. But, uh, but yes, uh, it's OK. But now I think we have just uh, um, no, we had these, I think, uh, no, the resources, uh, I think resources to learn Node.js we had, but then we can have more questions about uh, yeah, the pl Platformatic that... now. So nice. Um, so thank you so much, uh, Matteo. And uh, yes, let me invite uh, Michael. And then maybe if we have time at the end, I can invite you again if you're still there. Okay. Yay! By the way, bye -bye. we made it. We made it. No outage. <laughs> nice. Michael, perfect. So thank you so much uh, for, for being so patient and waiting <laughs> until now. So um, Michael, uh, please uh, introduce yourself because you work at uh, IBM and Red Hat now. Yeah, right? I'm the Node.js lead for Red Hat and IBM. And uh, today I'm going to be talking to you about uh, building Node.js add-ons like in 2023. Nice, nice. I really like this, uh, this title. So I don't know, we, today we're really getting everything about Node.js. I forgot to say that in the past episode, we had a, we had a speaker introducing the Node.js tests because it was about testing tools. So we like Node, like <laughs> it's there. And uh, yes, so I really like, it's an intriguing title. So uh, Michael, when you want, you can start. I don't know if you want to say more about yourself, about this presentation, and then I wish you. Yeah, I have a little bit about myself. I'm, as I said, okay. I'm the Node.js lead for Red Hat and IBM. What that okay. means is I get to be a really active uh, member of the community. I'm, I'm a collaborator on the technical steering committee member, uh, technical steering committee, uh, active in a bunch of working groups, include the, including the Node add-on Node add API, which is what I'm going to talk to you about today, um, as well as being active in the foundation and working with some great teams within Red Hat and IBM. Uh, for example, we have a team who builds the ODBC package that uses Node API. So it's great to be able to work across all those different groups in terms of their Node usage. And there's just my contact info if you want to follow me or, or get in contact. Just before I get started, I'll give you a little bit of a, a insight into the agenda that I'm going to cover. I'm going to talk about native add-ons. Why do you need them? I'll talk about alternatives. Uh, Colin mentioned uh, FFI, so I'll just touch on that as well. We'll talk about building C++ add-ons. I'll talk about Node API and Node add-on Node add API and why I think they're so great. Uh, and some of the, one of the great things is you can start to use Node API with other languages and other runtimes. So I'm going to show you some of that. And then finally, I'll finish up with some resources and some info on how to get involved if I've got you excited about uh, add-ons and the work in the project. Um, so first of all, what are add-ons? So Really what they are is the ability to write JavaScript functions, objects, and JavaScript code in a language other than JavaScript. So I can use C, 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 C++ has been the typical use case, and I can run JavaScript and create objects that effectively look just like JavaScript objects when I use them on the JavaScript side. But why would I want to do that? Well, the first thing is there's a lot of existing code in other languages. So there's large code bases. And some of the main big packages like Sharp, Bcrypt, SQLite, et cetera, they are all written in C, C++. And instead of having to rewrite them all in JavaScript, we want to reuse that code. So Node add-ons let us wrap that code and reuse it within our, our JavaScript applications. The second reason is reuse. 
Some things just run faster in other languages. So sometimes we want to drop down to some other language to be able to write some code quickly um, that will run quickly. And then finally, there's some resources which just aren't available from JavaScript nat natively. So for example, serial port, um, you know, we don't have native access. So you need to be able to use native code that integrates in your operating system to be able to drop down, get access to those, to that, the sort of hardware resources. And that's sort of like another reason why you would want native add-ons. So are there some alternatives? And the answer is yes. Instead of using native add-ons, you can, you can look at things like foreign function FFI, which is the foreign function interface. There's actually a package, the node FFI NAPI package that lets you do that. Um, and there's a PR to potentially even add FFI into the into to Node Core as well. Right from the beginning, when we were working on on Node Node add-on, Node API, there's a discussion on FFI, and it's always been seen as sort of a complementary technology. Um, another one which is is newer is Wasm, and it lets you compile existing code. So you could take your C C++ code or Rust code, compile it to Wasm, and then you can load and run that in in your Node. In your new program. But the reality is that uh, the alternatives don't cover all the use cases. Uh, FFI, for example, lets us call, like lets JavaScript call uh, native functions, but it's a much more restricted sort of relationship. You can't necessarily call back from your C code into JavaScript. Um, you can really just call the exposed C functions and they have to generally have a more limited uh, set of APIs uh, uh, that are, compared to what is possible with Node and APIs. Um, and so your add-on lets you do sort of, you know, more complex uh, calls back and forth between JavaScript and native code, which you couldn't necessarily do with FFI. Wasm does allow uh, calling back to JavaScript and native and vice versa, but the boundary is still more limited. And actually by design, uh, based on the security model for Wasm, it's actually quite limited in terms of what it can reach out in, in the environment as well. So. The, the use case of needing to get access to, say, physical devices like serial port, you wouldn't necessarily be able to do that in Wasm either. So the answer is there are some, some alternatives. For some use cases, they might make sense. But in a lot of use cases, it makes sense to go with native add-ons. So think back to 2014. This is about five years after Node.js was created. Uh, NAN became 1.0. And that's the native abstractions for Node. Before 2014, writing Node add-ons was basically writing directly to the V8C, C, C++ APIs. They evolved at a fairly good pace, and people found that it was hard to keep up. So you'd have to actually update your native add-ons on a regular basis, um, make chain, make code changes. And so NAN was born to try and simplify that. And, and it was the sort of a first attempt at providing a wrapper to reduce some of the churn that you, you faced when you were using um, the, the, the V8 APIs. This code shows how we would write uh, a, uh, a basic Hello World add-on using NAN. You can see up here, we, we define a method. In that method, we create a string um, where we're creating this new world string and returning it. And then you know, in our initialization function, we basically say, OK, we're going to export that function um, and generate. What you'll notice, though, it still is tied fairly directly to V8. We're still using V8 basic types. It's also using things like function templates. And so while it's provided some wrappers to try and hide some of the things which changed more, more, most frequently in, in V8, it doesn't completely provide an abstraction from V8 and still tied very directly to it and subject to some of the changes that takes place there. The other thing is by design, because of the, the close binding to V8, if you actually try and run your, your version, so in this case, you can see up here, I've set version 16. That's what I've compiled the add-on for. I run uh, my node hello.js, which uses that add-on, runs fine. I then run my script here to set the version to 18. I try and run again, and I get this, this error, which basically says, hey, You've compiled against a version of Node that has Node mod not module version um, 93, and you're trying to use it with Node module version 108. There's in that, that's incompatible. Sorry, you can't do that. And so it's basically very tightly coupled to the version of Node V8 you're using and to a very specific version of Node. So 
every for every different version of Node, you have to recompile. Add-ons often do that, but another model is also where uh, where uh, package authors want to pre-compile binaries and provide those so so that you don't need to have all those compilers and the whole stack required for your package on uh, the the end user's uh, machine because quite often that's a, a pretty high barrier. But and in this case, you needed to actually create a lot of different binaries, one for each version of Node that you wanted to support. So let's move forward to 2018. That's when Node API became stable in Node 8.12.0. And Node API was meant to hit the 80% use case. Uh, Mateo always already referred in, in the earlier talk to the 80-20 rule. And really, you know, we think we can cover 80% of the use cases with Node API. There's still maybe 20% where you need the absolute best performance or you need to use APIs um, that uh, are in V8 but are very tied to that particular implementation. Um, you know, so we don't provide a the, the full set of APIs in Node API, but we provide a subset which are uh, agnostic to the runtime and which we think will cover most uh, use cases when you're writing your add-ons. This is what it looks like to write your add-on in C, C++ with Node API. It's a C-based API because that's what gives us ABI stability. And ABI stability means if I write it against one version of Node, the next version of Node will, will continue to run um, and I won't even need to recompile. You can still see we have similar code here. We have this nappy create string UTF, which is creating a, a string um, and we return that. Uh, you know, one thing you, you should notice here is that like this is completely divorced from the underlying runtime. All of the types um, and all of the function calls are defined within Node API and basically hide the implementation underneath. But you know, you'll see this looks similar. In our hello world, we, we define a method, we um, you know, create a string within that method, we return the string, and then similarly we have an init function which will declare that method on the exports and return the exports. And over here, I have the code which actually you know, uses that. It requires the, the, hello, by, the hello native add-on and we just run it you know, calling add-on.hello. And you'll see that that's pretty much the same across all of the different examples. So in this case, I'm gonna re rerun what I showed you earlier where um, you know, I set my version to 16, I run my node dash dash version, and it runs fine and gives me my hello world. I then switch my version to 18. So I'm just running a script which sets me to 18. You can see I do a version to show that. And I run with the exact same uh, add-on. I don't get that big message saying, hey, you've got a mismatch between the versions. And that's because if you use the functions and restrict yourself to the functions in node add-on API or to node API, it's ABI stable and your, 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 your binary, which was compiled, will run either with 16, 18, 20, and actually all the way back to, you know, we included an eight if you use an, uh, the earliest version of, of uh, Node API. Now, you may have looked at the earlier code that I showed you in C and said, boy, that's a little bit more verbose. There's more lines. Um, and that's true because in C, it, it just is ver more verbose and, and V8 itself and NAN are C++ based, um, which allows them to be more concise. But the good news is, is we have something called Node Add-on API. This is a package um, that you can use in your projects and it provides a C++, C++, a C++ wrapper around the C-based Node API. And that really lets you get the, 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 the advantage of using the ABI stable C interface, which is exported from the Node uh, binary but use C++ code, which is much more concise. And so this wrapper brings us down to probably, you know, the same or less lines of code. Again, should look very familiar. We're creating a string with the, the contents of world. We declare, uh, we have an init, init module, init function, sorry. And in there we set, ex on our exports, we set a method called hello, and we pass it the function that we've defined that's gonna return world uses the same JavaScript code down here as we did with our earlier one. And we're sort of back to having the nice conciseness that you can get with C++, but we've got something that's ABI stable, which is, which is really great. So why is Node API and Node Add-on API so great? Well, first of all, it's ABI stable, as I mentioned. So there's no code changes need to, to needed for new Node.js versions. And you really get that build once run with later Node versions. 
Um, and that's important, like I mentioned, for people who want to provide pre-built binaries in particular. So if I want to have a binary uh, package, which is my native and includes my native module, and I want to support multiple versions of Node, I can build one of those and it will run against all the, the you know, the, the existing versions of Node.js, which are LTS and future versions of Node.js as well, which is really great. It also means that even if you're building your add-on dynamically when it's installed through npm install, uh, you don't necessarily need to make new, uh, any code changes. So even when you, people move up to a new version of Node, it should still keep working because the same ABI is there. The concept and operations of uh, Node API generally map to the ideas and concepts specified in the ECMA 262 language specification. So we try and limit what we put into there to things which are related to that spec and therefore we believe can be implemented by all JavaScript runtimes. What's nice about that is it brings cross runtime compatibility. So not only can you write your add-ons to work with Node, but they're gonna work with other runtimes like Bon and Dino. Um, also, you get cross-language support, and I'll, I'll show you a little bit of that in the slides that, that follow, but you can actually now start to write your add-ons in other languages, so you're not restricted to C and C++, and if you've got a great piece of code in Rust, you can wrap that up and reuse it in an add-on as well. And we're really working to make the Node API the standard for writing JavaScript code not in JavaScript um, from Node itself. So Node is obviously the primary place where it's maintained and implemented, um, but we're trying to do things like um, separate out the uh, headers and so forth. And I'll talk about that a little bit in, 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 in slides that follow. So just touching on runtime compatibility. So it's obviously supported by Node, but there's runtimes for, uh, uh, they're now bindings for Node API and another of a, a number of other runtimes, including Bun, Dino, um, Electron uses it uh, you know, being based off of uh, C, off of uh, Node itself. Um, but there are some others as well, like EMNAPI, IoTJS, IOT Veil, and so forth, which have also implemented uh, Node API as a way to integrate with the uh, add-on. So that cross runtime compa compatibility is really great, and I'm really I'm really uh, happy that you know we've achieved the separation from the underlying opera, uh, you know uh, JavaScript engine. Uh, which made this possible. Um, and part of that sort of separation is that, you know, we've, we're have we trying to make it even easier to build so that you don't necessarily have to link against Node to get the header. So we actually have a, uh, a headers repository. I think we're actually already at V1. Um, so if you want to compile against a Node API, instead of having to compile against Node itself, you can actually pull the headers down from Node.js, Node, Node API headers, and build your applications, you know, uh, without linking against Node or, or pulling in things from Node, but having a generating a, a um, uh, an add-on that will run with Node and and those other runtimes. Not there yet, and and maybe not going to be there as as soon as. But we also have the vision of trying to pull out the tests. We have a nice test suite within the Node.js uh, project. Um, but it would be nice to be able to run that set of tests against things other than Node a little bit more easily than you can today. So that we also have a repo where the end goal is to try and pull out the, the testing that we have in Node um, so it can be run separately, just like for the headers. We looked at cross runtime support. The other thing that Node API has enabled is cross language support. So there's Node API bindings for other languages. Rust, um, there's a number of different ones for Rust. Um, as well as some which are maybe at a little bit more early stage for other languages like C, C Sharp, Swift, Zig, Go, and so forth. So you can st we're certainly we're starting to get to the point where you can write your native add-ons in other languages, um, which is again opening up another other uh, new ecosystems and new ways you can write add-ons that are going to end up working with Node.js, which is great. I want to look at one of those examples, so I picked Neon because it actually when I looked at it. Of the ones I looked at, it, it, it seemed the most familiar to me when using a Node add-on API and, and sort of the, the, the flavor there. You can look at the code. Um, you know, I generated, uh, uh, you know, their, their example. And I can create, uh, you know, a method, which is that hello method. It creates a string. It looks very similar to what we saw in Node add-on API, where we basically said, like, hey, I want to say new string. Here I've got, you know, cx.string world. And then similarly, you know, I, I, I have a main function where I 
add to my exports, hello, and the method that I've defined. So, you know, if you looked at my earlier examples, this should look fairly familiar, except now we're writing in Rust, which is really great. And my JavaScript code just looks the same. So I can, you know, from the JavaScript perspective, I get the same add-on. I can call the method the same way and, and everything works just similarly. A few things I did have to do when I was using Neon is I did have to, um, you know, I, my example uses the bindings uh, package to pull in and find the add-on. So I had to tweak uh, the build script a little bit that was generated so that it knew where to find my hello, um, uh, where, where to basically where to build the add-on, which is hello.node, so that the bindings could find it. But other than that, it was pretty easy using the tools that were available in, in, in Neon. The other thing I wanted to do is to show that um, I could do something a little bit more complex. So I took the hello world and I just added to it where instead of just you know returning a single string, I create an object. So you can see here, I, I create an empty object. I get the first start up by getting the a value of an argument, get an empty, create an empty object, create that same you know hello world string. But then I add that that string as the answer to the, the empty object. I then add the value of one of the arguments to the empty object. And then, you know, similarly to the previous one, I'm just exporting that particular function. And so that shows that I can still write effectively JavaScript. I'm creating an object, I'm setting values on it, I could create functions and so forth, but again, doing that all in Rust. So now we see I, I showed some C, C add-ons, I showed some in Rust. And I was running those with Node. But let's take a look at running the add-ons with one of the other um, uh, runtimes that's available out there. And I, to do that, I chose Bun. Um, so I, I took, I took the, in my existing Hello World, and I tried to just do a Bun install and then run the add-on. That didn't quite work. Um, uh, maybe I didn't spend enough time trying to get it work uh, to, to work. So. The bun install didn't necessarily build the native add-on, but when I did an npm install, um, I got further. The, the The remaining issue I had is that um, it, it didn't the bindings package didn't seem to work with bun, and I think I found some existing issues on on problems with that that may get solved over time. So I modified my uh, my 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 um, JavaScript code to actually point directly to where uh, the 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 native add-on was instead of using bindings. And then I could just run that uh, that add-on. So that add-on was built with, with NPM, but I could run the native add, you know, the, the binary with bun and, and it worked just fine. I repeated this with my Rust built add-on and it was just okay. So you can see here, I, I'm basically, you know, saying, hey, I'm gonna run that JavaScript program uh, that opens and runs the, the binary with node, works great exact same binaries work with bun as well. And that's really nice to see that, hey, I've got add-ons, which if I want to build them, I can build them once, and now they're going to run for Node, Dino, and bun. So now we're in 2023. And what is it like to build add-ons in 2023? I now have a ABI stable interface. I don't need to make code changes every time there's a new version of Node.js. Node I can build once. So not only do I not have to recompile or make code changes, but I don't have to recompile. I can have a single binary that supports multiple versions of Node. And if I want to provide pre-built binaries, my life is much, much easier. Not only that, I can write in different languages, which is fantastic. Um, I can run with different runtimes. And you know, I said earlier that we're targeting the 80% use case. And I think so far we've hit 38% of that 80%. Uh, I do this is very unscientific, but you know I'm looking at the downloads for NAN and Node Add-on API. This isn't going to cover all the use cases because people could be using Node API directly as opposed to using the Node Add-on API wrapper. But this is a, a reasonable sort of uh, look at what's going on. If I add the numbers together and calculate how many are using uh, Node Add-on API, it's about 38% today. So we've maybe we're halfway to that 80% use case, which is which is where we think we can get to. Um, and I think you know you can see there's still a fairly steady upward trend in terms of the use of Node Add-on API um, versus NAN, which is kind of sort of tailing off as as we go forward. So I think very good progress on on moving towards being the 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 go-to for that 80% use case. Uh, 
So that's what I wanted to show you. And before I close out, I'm just going to leave you with a, free re a few resources. These are some great links to um, the Node API doc. So it's well documented. Uh, the, the C API is well documented in the Node API docs. Uh, there's some additional Node add-on API doc. We have an examples GitHub repository, which have code for simple things like hello world, creating functions, creating objects, and so forth. Um, and then there's a number of other things like the engine bindings, which will, will show you what other engines currently support uh, Node API as well. Also want to mention that we have very active teams. So we have a Node API team. Uh, these are the most active contributors right now. Um, it's a great team. We get together once a week. And so if you're interested in, in Node API and helping to move uh, that, that sort of technology forward, um, we welcome you to come and get involved and help uh, move things forward. Really great and interesting discussions there. We most recently made like a, a small shift in how we're managing the Node API versions. We're still going to maintain ABI stability in terms of if you stick to a particular Node API version, you won't have to make any changes. And so you, you can continue to work across Node versions. Um, but some really interesting discussions. And this is the team where most of those things take place. Um, you can find the meetings uh, on the calendar. So this is Node.js, the Node.js.org slash calendar. And in there will be the, you know, the, the date time. If you're looking at the time here, I think it's GMT. It's 11 Eastern for me. Um, but you can get all the details on how to join us there. So that's uh, everything that I, I wanted to share with you. And hopefully, you'll be starting to make your Node add-ons like it's 2023. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Michael. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so this was super interesting. And uh, I have one question on my side. So I'm going to yeah. abuse, my, abuse my powers because I code in different languages. For example, now I'm getting used to, to Rust. So I've been following this, uh, this presentation and it's, it's cool. Um, is there any like specific use cases for Rust or maybe an example that I can try, I don't know, to implement live? So do you give me some ideas or maybe or something which might be specific for Rust or maybe, I don't know. Yeah, I don't, I don't have say. like, hey, you would want to use Rust as opposed to C for a particular use case. I think it's more like if you want to use Rust because it gives you memory type safety or some of the other reasons that people choose Rust over C, C++, um, it gives you that advantage. So it's not, you know, the, the whole goal is that you could actually write the exact same add-on in either language, right? And that's the beauty that that it's allowed you to have the opportunity to do it in your language of choice versus, you know, a smaller subset. Yeah, absolutely. And this is also what I'm doing, like doing this in different languages. So it might be interesting maybe trying to implement a plugin for node in different languages but with the same even with the same use case just to showcase for example different languages this is something that I've been uh, if, if you want to do something like that like I mentioned that node add that that uh, node add-on examples that actually has examples in the the the, 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 the node API C level interface it also then has node add-on API examples. And it might be interesting to have a few examples there, which were then like, okay, and here's how you do the equivalent in Rust, right? And because you know they're broken down into some of them are, are sort of bigger, more functional ones, but a lot of them are like, hey, here's how you create a function, here's how you create an object, here's how you create those different things. So if you're kind of looking for a set of things to work through, that's a great set of examples that you could start with. And I'm even thinking that like you know, PRing in, in PR, PRing in and here's how you do that for these other ones would actually be a you know a value add for that repo as well. Perfect, perfect. Thank you so much, uh, Michael. So we are about uh, the end of this uh, event. So what I'd like to do now is first of all uh, thank you to all the speakers. Uh, let me invite them again. They should be ready. Let's see. So today it went. Uh, so smooth it's okay i'm happy because we have all, <laughs> we still have all the three speakers uh, here so thank you so much i also learned a lot i got some inspirations for some content i might create so thank you thank you and uh, yes so in the chat if you want you can drop uh, i we had many people of course uh, We'll be talking about uh, Carbonara, Matteo. You made an example from a bad spaghetti code, but then you put a very good uh, P 
picture of spaghetti. So I don't know. This is, uh, uh, I think that as Italians, so we are not allowed to show bad spaghetti. So we are not allowed. So you 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 put still like a good picture of spaghetti. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, so yes so thank you uh the spaghetti before... are good for food are good. you know you eat spaghetti you don't put them in the absolutely absolutely we need it probably is lunch... <laughs> it is lunchtime for me too so you're making me hungry <laughs> yes it's all it's almost dinner time here and yes so Last shout out for Daily Dev. By the way, it's Daily Dev, but this event is the monthly dev. So maybe this is why you got a bit confused about that because this is a monthly event, but we we work we work daily, so for for sure. So, <laughs> so this is the the idea. And uh, yeah, so we've been doing this for all, the next uh, event in June. It will be the thirtieth the thirtieth episode. So amazing. And yes, so uh, about the dev, we have great upcoming features. I don't know if you see here at the top right, you can basically now create a community. It's called a squad and you can share stuff here. So we are going more in the com on the community side. So this might be interesting. Of course, it's free for everyone. And we are adding features like crazy in here. And yeah, so if you want to reserve your handle, this is your time. And uh, yes, so... Thank you so much uh, for the speakers. Uh, we are at the end uh, today. So yes, perfect. Uh, if you have something else uh, to say, don't uh, forget uh, to follow all the three speakers. Uh, I dropped uh, their handle in the chat. Uh, we have handles uh, in the description. Amazing uh, presentations. I really love them. We have Colin here. We have Matteo here and Michael, of course. So we did uh, everything. Thank you so much for your support. Uh, we, yeah. We are done for, for today. If you have something else to say, if you want to say bye, and then we can wrap it up. No, oh, great. Thanks. It was great being here. Nice. Perfect. So tomorrow we'll add also chapters for the separate uh, um, presentations. So we'll share this again on social media. And that's it. We are done. And yes, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much, Matteo, Michael, and Colin. Perfect. We are done. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.